Hello and welcome to another macro problem. Uh, here we're going to be dealing with the ISLM model. Um, just kind of to know what's coming up ahead. Um, one way ISLM is useful is that it ties together two parts of the economy we think are particularly important. So like the trade-off between the consumption of goods and services and the desire to save and invest. Um, so that's the IS curve. And then also the market for money, reflecting the supply and demand for money in the economy. So that's the LM curve. Um, tying these things together to determine equilibrium religious rates and uh, you know GDP, so Y, which is stands for output or income. Since we might want to change Y, you know GDP and economy, and we might want to change other economic variables, a model that helps us understand how uh, religious rates and you know Y, the GDP, output, income uh, are determined can be quite helpful for us. So thus the ISLM model helps us think about these things more clearly. Uh, and this, bar this question is borrowed from Mencu's Macroeconomics, um, Chapter 11, which in the edition that I have is uh, Aggregate Demand Part 1. They seem to shift around chapters and not much else from edition to edition. Um, and then Problem 5. So uh, this is the question. The following equation describe an economy. So over here we have uh, this equation, and then over here we have these equations. I, I happen to split them up into the IS curve and the LM curve, but we'll get to that in a second. Um, part A asks the following. So identify each of the variables and briefly explain their meaning. So starting off with Y. Y stands uh, represents real output or real income, which is the value of uh, you know all goods and services produced in the economy. So that's real output. Uh, and this has to be equal to the value of income earned in um, producing those goods and services. So real income. Um, the variable C here uh, stands for consumption. Consumption depends positively on disposable income. So the amount that people consume is going to depend on this term right here, disposable income. So that's income minus taxes. And we could also see that uh, consumption here is influenced by this term, which is the marginal propensity to consume. So if your income goes up, then we're saying that your consumption is going to increase, but only by this marginal propensity to consume. We also note this kind of like default level of consumption. So let's suppose that this person has no disposable income. So if that whole thing goes away, this person's still going to consume some amount, that amount right there. So up next, I want to point out um, the real interest rate. Um, so that's that R right there. The real interest rate is um, if you invest, you know, if you save some of your income and you invest, you can expect to earn this real interest rate. Um, so next we have investment. Uh, the variable I represents investment by firms. Um, where firms purchase uh, you know, new capital goods, that counts as investment. If firms um, increase their inventories, that also counts as, as an investment in uh, when GDP is calculated. So note that um, investment is negatively related to the real interest rate. So if the real interest rate increases, investment's going to go down, right? That intuitively should make sense because uh, the real interest rate represents the cost of borrowing. So if it's more costly to borrow, uh, it's more costly to invest. And then similarly, 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 if the real interest rate decreases, the cost of borrowing has gone down, and we might expect interest rates to. Uh, so we might expect investment to increase. Uh, this variable G. Uh, represents um, the government's purchasing, so the purchase of government goods and services. So think of it as the government spending on newly produced goods and services. Uh, we're just going to call this some number that's determined almost exogenously. Uh, and then taxes here, uh, T, which is um, uh, equal to this amount. This is how much money the government collects. Um, notice that we have Y minus T standing in for disposable income. So the variable over here, M, stands for the money supply, which is the nominal money supply. Pre P is the price level, so it's an index of current prices. And so M over P um, stands for the real money supply. Um, we have this notational thing, because this equation here represents money demand. So this is uh, equation describes how much people demand in terms of money from the economy. So this exponent here of D is just a notational thing. There's no value of D that we're raising this to in terms of an exponent, it's just a notational thing. So money demand is equal to how much um, goods and services are produced minus 20 times the real interest rate. 
Um, and then this should also have some um, economic intuition to it as well, particularly this term right here. The idea is, um, you know, if you have cash, if you have savings, you kind of have two choices um, that you could do with that savings. You could leave it as cash, as money, or you could invest it, right? If you invest it, you're going to earn this interest rate R. And so if that interest rate R is high, you can expect to earn a high interest rate. And so you want to convert your money into uh, investment and then vice versa as well. But then also, you know, if uh, real income increases, if GDP goes up, we can expect money demand to go up as well. So moving on to Part B, Part B asks to, uh, from the list above, use the relevant set of equations to derive the IS curve and then graph the IS curve on the appropriate labeled graph, on, on an appropriately labeled graph. So to start off with the IS curve, we start off with uh, the basic kind of GDP accounting identity for an economy. So real income, uh, it's going to be equal to uh, what, you know, things are being spent in the economy. So there's three places for real incomes to go, government spending, investment, and consumption. So that's this first step here. So now we can start kind of plugging stuff in. So what is C equal to? Consumption is equal to this term here. Uh, what's investment equal to? Investment is equal to this term here. And then government spending that we already determined was 50. So we're just plugging those numbers in. Next step, we're, I'm just going to kind of simplify things a little bit. Uh, taxes, actually I'm adding in taxes, taxes are 40, um, so you add that into this portion here, standing in for uh, disposable income. Uh, up next, let's simplify everything together. You add all the numbers together, you get 250 times uh, 0.5y minus 10r. So in the next step, we're going to subtract um, half y from both sides. So this is y over here is equal to blah, 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 half y. So minusing half y from both sides, we get um, 1 half y is equal to 250 minus uh, 10r. So that implies our IS curve, you know, when we double both sides, is equal to y is equal to 500 minus 20r. So the last part asks us to graph the IS curve on an appropriately labeled graph. So that's what I've done over here. Um, so traditionally what we do is we put the real interest rate on the vertical axis, so that's R. Make sure you always label that stuff. Um, output slash incomes, or you know, real output or real income, which is Y here, is gonna be on the horizontal axis. So plugging this in, um, I wanna point out that it's kind of a little unusual, right? So our IS curve traditionally is written as Y is equal to these numbers. However, when you graph stuff, you usually have the y-axis on the vertical and the x on along the horizontal axis, right? But the way this is written, um, we have the horizontal axis on the left-hand side, and then the vertical axis uh, variable is in the right-hand side. So if you remember back to, um, you know, kind of, I guess, geometry, that is, uh, I kind of rewrote this so that we have r, you know, our vertical axis term here, so or kind of our y-axis term there, is equal to something as a function of our horizontal axis term. So, um, you know, the intercept over here is going to be 25, so somewhere down over here is going to be, I'm sorry, somewhere up over here is going to be 25. And then the slope of this line is going to be equal to negative uh, 1 20th. So that's the slope of this line right here. And then there's our IS curve. Um, even just by looking at this, because there's a negative sign in front of our R term, we know that it's going to be a negative relationship between these two terms. So we know that the IS curve is going to be downward sloping. But yeah, so the simple thing is uh, make sure you have your axes right, real interest right here, um, Y over here, and then the IS curve is downward sloping. Moving on to part C, um, from the list above, use the relevant set of equations to derive the LM curve. Graph the LM curve on the same graph you used in part B. So uh, these are the these are the guess, equations that we are going to use to derive our LM curve. So up here is the money demand equation. Uh, here is nominal money supply, and then here's the price level. Um, we find the LM curve by setting real money demand equation, which is up here, um, equal to the money supply, which is just M over P right there. So that's what we're going to do. Uh, and when you simplify stuff out, you know, it's pretty simple math. We find 
Um, here's the money demand equation. Here's a uh, real money supply. So our LM curve takes this form. So y is equal to 300 plus 20r. If you remember from the IS curve, we had uh, some number minus 20r, telling us that the IS curve was downward sloping. Now our LM curve has this plus a positive sign in front of r. So we know that our LM curve is going to be upward sloping. So plotting that onto the same graph as we had our IS curve, we now have an LM curve right here. Now the last question, um, D asks us, what is the equilibrium level of income and equilibrium interest rate? So in order to find the equilibrium level of real interest rate and the um, equilibrium you know, output or income, so equilibrium Y, we need to set the LM curve equal to the IS curve, uh, and then we'll kind of use these equations to solve for the equilibrium real interest rate, and then after that, equilibrium output. So uh, here's our two equations, the IS curve and the LM curve. So step one is let's set them equal to one another. So take our IS curve and LM equations, um, set the like terms equal to each other. So notice you have a Y is equal to all this stuff, and then you have a Y is equal to all this stuff. So you could set this portion of the IS curve equal to this portion of the LM curve, which I do more clearly in the next step. Bam, there. Uh, so here's our IS curve portion equal to our um, LM curve portion. When we solve this out, we're going to find out where those two lines intersect. So just kind of going through the math, probably don't need to do all this, but the equilibrium real interest rate, which we're going to note with a star, usually you kind of indicate a steady state level or equilibrium level with a star. So our star is going to be 5%. Um, so we have equilibrium real interest rate. Now how do we find equilibrium output or income. Well, we do that by simply plugging in our equilibrium real interest rate back into either of these equations. And it doesn't really matter which equation because it's going to find out the same value of y star either way. So um, what we're going to do is plug in our equilibrium real interest rate in either the IS curve or the LM curve, which we do right here. So plugging 5 in there, in either case you find a um, equilibrium output or income, you know, equilibrium y here is equal to 400. Uh, and then graphing those together, what we get is the following. The intersection where the um, IS curve intersects the LM curve is at this point right here, when output's 400 and the real interest rate's 5. Sweet, so that's that. Hopefully it was helpful. Um, if you have any questions, let me know. If you found this useful, um, be sure to give it a thumbs up. And uh, thanks and have a good day. Bye.